Well, moving ahead now, Nigerians may get not uh, too expensive internet services as the country is set to benefit from 1.2 billion pounds. That's more than 500 billion Naira intervention fund, which the British government plans to give some countries to bridge access to communications. The vice chairman, Nigerian Communications Commission, Umar Dambata, made this known in a meeting with the team from the United Kingdom's Department of Foreign and International Development. Now, more than 2 billion people have been cut off from internet as a result of high cost of mobile data. The Alliance for Affordable Internet in its 2018 affordability report says high connecting fees uh, keep many users offline, pushing global goals uh, of universal internet access out of reach. The Nigerian Communications Commission subscriber statistics for September puts internet users in the country at 105 million. Dambata says NCC and government of the United Kingdom agreed to partner on digital inclusion, cyber security and capacity building. The NCC boss added that this will boost the power of ICT to provide access to underserved and um, underserved areas in the country. Well, to discuss this, I have in the studio an ICT expert, Idowu Akinde. Thank you very much for joining us at this time. Thank you, sir. Let me start this way. How serious is the problem of exclusion um, uh, of Nigeria from the communications market? How serious is this? Okay, so, um, well, we, we could do very, very, very much better. Um, we are still, by way of a figurative um, expression, at the back of the class. Hmm. We could come to the fore. There's, 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 there's plenty of room for improvement. Yeah. Let's put it like that. I, I've heard a lot about financial inclusion and all of that, but now it's digital inclusion. Digital inclusion. So how, how far have we gone in this part of the world? Okay. Okay. So when you mention digital inclusion, uh, there's quite a number of aspects. Uh, so um, the first things that come to your mind are what are those immediate things? that the people who have higher levels of digital inclusion use that inclusion for? Uh, what, are the, what are the ways by which they feel the impact of a higher level of inclusion? One, um, access, access to services, access to various services. Two, education. You'd be surprised how much of education today is digital and how the even increased access to digital services can help us leapfrog many of the problems that we have with education. Things like health, um, agriculture, um, you know, um, emergency services, emergency and disaster notifications and relief and all of these things. You know, so these are the immediate things that come to mind. But um, if you if you think about each of these things that I've mentioned, you see that we still have quite a lot of work to do in those areas. So uh, sh initiatives like this from the from the UK, UK or from foreign donors are welcome. Of course, are, are, are always welcome, provided that we... Now, looking at, looking at this gap that has been identified, okay. uh, before now, has the Nigerian government been making any move to bridge this gap? Uh, <laughs> so that's a difficult question because I can't speak on behalf oh, of the Nigerian no, Just maybe little okay. efforts that you, maybe you've okay. seen to... Okay. Like okay. access to internet, it's yes. still on the high side. It's still on the high side. Uh, Nigeria is still one of the top 20 most expensive... Um, places to buy internet around the world. Um, however, uh, well, it, you know, the problem, the problem with, the, with whether or not the Nigerian government has tried to bridge the gap is like the problem of intention versus outcome slash result. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, given all of the rhetoric that we've heard, it does appear like the government is intending or has good intentions to bridge those gaps but we haven't seen much on the streets, let me put it like that. Now, you just commended the British government now looking okay. at this move to mm -hmm. actually help address all of this, but many saying that also think that what do they also stand to gain? Uh, it's not looking like, uh, what do they really stand to gain investing this amount of money? Okay, so, um, so the, 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 the way this foreign aid yeah, comes in. work is that um, they usually use them as opportunities. You know, think of it as the CSR of the mm. nations of the world. Mm. Okay, so where for companies, for corporate organizations within your local community or country, mm. you would be obliged to carry out some service to your community. 
this think of nations now carrying out some service to the global community in favor of those other areas of the world, of the globe, that are not as privileged as they are. So think of it like that. Uh, however, the, the, the silent, uh, not so obvious parts of that question are, um, do they just do these things for the paper? Are there, is there a direct correlation? If you study the data over the decades between the amounts expended as foreign aid to us in Africa, for instance, and, the, and whether there has been any improvement or not you know, over these decades. And then those, those data points start to look, they neither tell you yes or no. You know, so there, does, there may not be a strong correlation. That would be, but that would be a better way to put it statistically. Um, so, so it's difficult to answer that question, but um, one cannot refuse or one cannot say no to these things. I think that it just puts a greater burden on the receiver, okay, to try to be more participatory. Answer that question, but um, one cannot refuse or one cannot say no to these things. I think that it just puts a greater burden on the receiver, okay, to try to be more participatory, okay. more engaging in the process of receiving these aid so that we can be mindful and be deliberate about getting outcomes and getting deliverables out of these initiatives. Which remains very, very important. So now, some of the partners, we're talking about digital inclusion, you've talked about cyber security and capacity building okay. is also something that mm -hmm. was also mentioned part mm -hmm. of this agreement. Now, mm -hmm. we've had issues around cyber crimes and mm -hmm. all of that in this part of the mm -hmm. world and moves are there to checkmate all of this. How far have we gone? <laughs> the last time we, I know we spoke about this some yes, months back. Yes, and now, we still hear of issues, the yeah, banking yeah. sector, mm -hmm. and all of that. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? Okay, so again, um, it's, it's welcome to have this kind of offers yes. okay, for assistance, especially in the area, in the very, very critical area of cybersecurity. Um, again, I'd say that the greater burden lies on us okay, to be able to receive this aid and be able to translate it locally. So whether or not, for instance, whether or not uh, this kind of aid is coming, what are our own deliberate, conscious decisions or directions yeah. regarding cybersecurity? So that if this aid comes, then we know how to channel it in the direction that we are going. You know, so uh, that's, studying the local environment, that's what I would say we need to do. We need to determine exactly what we need to do. Uh, the CBN has done considerably well um, in enforcing, instructing and enforcing that the banks behave a certain way. Maybe a little bit more needs to be done, but at least it's not where we used to be a couple years ago. Um, for the other sectors, we need some more, some more stringent uh, cyber security initiatives, both on the regulatory side on the enforcement side and on the private sector initiative side. So more startups, more cybersecurity startups need to, need to come about. More cybersecurity commercial initiatives need to come about. People need to be generally more aware about how to secure themselves digitally. Hmm. Now, now, something was also mentioned here, rural technology solutions, mm -hmm. uh, something that can also bridge mm -hmm. this gap. Mm -hmm. Can you shed more light on what that really implies? Okay. Um, so, so for instance, if you take, if you, so for instance, the best, the best, the best analogy would okay. be to, would be to repeat a statement that is often heard in, in development circles. So people often say, Lagos is not Nigeria. Okay, to 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 help people appreciate the fact that the kinds of privileges or environment that people enjoy in Lagos. Sometimes if you, if you live in Lagos for a long stretch of time, you kind of forget that there are huge swaths of underserved, unserved places outside the urban hotspots in Nigeria, you know, the major cities. Uh, the concept I'm trying to lead is that, too, is that usually the kind of infrastructure that we take for granted and depend on for daily life in Lagos, for instance, doesn't exist or exists at very, very poor levels in other places. So things like basic telephony, electricity, of course, you know, having, having put that aside, internet access, okay, 
Over here, we have options. If, we, if, we're, if we're not satisfied with the telco providers, we can switch to any of these local Wi-Fi providers. And, when, and you discover that whenever you travel outside Lagos, just to get internet, you have to rely on the local providers, you know, and so on and so forth. You know. So yeah. these, these are the challenges. Hopefully, again, if, if we decide as a people that we've identified these challenges and we're ready to close these gaps, yeah. then we can take help from a foreign partner and use it to close those gaps. But if help comes and we're not clear on what we want to achieve, it may be difficult to know what to do with that help. Idoa Kinde, ICT expert, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us thank on you this very, very important too. topic. Thank you very much.